Bob, welcome back. How are you, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Good. We have some things to chew over here, Bob. Uh, oh, there's a lot going uh, on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, I think uh, the the event of the month was uh, what happened with the tenure yesterday and what's happening with the yields. And, you know, I'll just put up the chart here. They're trying to sell them off now, but it almost looks like we're trying to break out to the upside in yields. Um, pretty solid looking week. You know, there's a daily, but it's Friday. So let's see on the weekly basis, uh, nothing negative about that. Almost looks like uh, if I covered up the title of the chart, um, you would say it looks bullish and we should see new highs, which means new highs in yields. Uh, am I, should I be stabilized and put on lithium? Or uh, can you can you see that? or can you see this uh, interest rate scenario narrative playing out? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a there's a fair amount here in terms of you know starting to get the move, and I, I mean, I guess it's really been it's been a few weeks going on here around the market kind of coming back to higher for longer, right? I mean, I think we obviously had the deflationary. Uh, depression, depression, shock that came with the SVB situation, and where I don't know. At one point, we got we got to a point where were there like four cuts priced into 2023, 2024 cuts into 2023, which yeah. was pretty shocking uh, and set up for a great trade on you know those December 23s, and that has been unwound. You know, we now see the short rate curve, at least pricing in almost a hike and it being held for between now and all the way to uh, February or March of next year. So we're moving, but there's still a fair number of cuts, five cuts priced into 24. And, you know, we haven't gotten above those peak yields that we saw yeah. uh, last summer, uh, last, yeah. last early fall. And that's really that will be a very telling moment where we finally got to a point where we started to price in, you know, the reality of higher for longer uh, in, in a serious way. And so, you know, I think this, as you say, this sort of bullish trend looking at this, uh, looking at this chart seems bullish, meaning yields up. Uh, seems- Why do you think we are uh, risk likes it so much, Bob? I mean, uh, I, I would think that, uh, you know, the market was, uh, I think expecting stable to lower yields. Um, that the bonds have turned. Uh, I mean, they turned away the bonds. Uh, I'll use CLT for a proxy uh, right at that 104 level, which uh, you know was a pretty key level. Yep. And then and then gap lower yesterday. Um, they look, you know, I you know there are a lot of people looking for myself included. If we got to 104, that was a pretty good signal. But they look vulnerable here now. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I- I think the, the the question it's an interesting question because you know typically if you'd if you'd expect to see increases in expectations of tightening that should be bad for the equity market and risk yeah. assets more broadly, but it's not playing out that way. And I think because the the flavor of higher for longer that we're experiencing right now is a flavor where the Fed is still a few steps behind the curve, and that's important okay. because basically what it's telling you is if the Fed remains a little bit behind the curve and nominal growth remains pretty good, which, you know, uh, first quarter nominal growth was great. Second quarter nominal growth is going to be totally fine as we close it out. Um, That will keep the pressure on to have higher interest rates, but it will also be supportive to the equity market, right? Because the, you know, equities, you always got to remember, equities are a nominal asset, right? Inflation in general is good for equities as long as it doesn't induce an aggressive tightening by the central bank, right? That That is so moderate, even relatively elevated inflation is like totally fine for the stock market. And so what we're seeing is this higher for longer, fed a bit behind the curve, stocks outperforming bonds and um, and kind of like the the I would say sort of the party continues, right? The liquidity party continues because even though the Fed's tightening, it's just like not enough. The Fed is not ahead of the curve; they're behind the curve in terms of tightening sufficiently given the macro data. Okay, uh, interesting take, and I know you are also uh, focused. Uh, I went to your stream, 
And you're talking a lot about the uh, stickiness of inflation, I think uh, more in Europe as well as the US, but it uh, seems like you're concentrating on what's happening in Europe. And I'm wondering uh, if the central bank um, ECB uh, is going to get ahead of the Fed and that we're gonna have a weaker a dollar, stronger Euro, stronger cable. Does it, is that what you're seeing translating yeah, I, here? I, I, I don't see that yet. And the big reason why that is, is because the sensitivity of the European economy and of the UK economy to interest rate rises is higher than that uh, of the US. And so I think there was a, a brief moment where kind of folks were, I mean, that, that period where it looked like Europe was, you know, strong and inflationary pressure was a little high and the, the euro got a bit of a bid. Um, but, I, but, but that's unlikely to be the long-term structural situation since, um, you know, we have seen a touch of moderation in inflation in Europe, you know, depending on how hard you squint in the last couple of months in core. And because, you know, the economies in Europe, the, the growth rate in, in Europe is at zero or worse, probably a little worse at this point, you know, the U.S. economy is growing it too. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. economy is stronger, less sensitive to interest rate hikes. Uh, Fed has a lot more work to do. Europe is slower, more sensitive that, to interest that rate That favors hikes. a dollar. And that, that favors, favors a dollar, dollar. right? Because the U.S. will probably need tighter monetary policy for longer, particularly rel relative to Europe, but also you know, relative to the U.K., which is also more sensitive to the hikes. It's just they've got a bit more of an inflation problem. But, you know, I would not yeah. I would not call the end of the dollar yet. <laughs> OK, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it the end of the I'm not, uh, you know, uh, in the big de dollarization camp. Uh, but I do think that there is a possibility for uh, the euro to make a move, maybe back towards 112, one more jiggle. You know, there's always detours. Yeah. Uh, oh, of course. Of course. What right. are you seeing that that looks interesting? Is, is it just this longer term trend that yeah, it, is getting you fired up? Yeah. And the uh, formation that I, uh, you know, have taught a lot of people to three drive to a top formation. And I see that possibility at 112 so we'll see Got you it. know the big the big thing that currency traders are paying attention to is uh the relentless recovery the in u.s dollar <laughs> yen uh kind of kind of goes with the uh parabolic move that we've seen in the nikkei bob yeah yeah i mean there's nothing better for japanese companies than a lower yen right i mean they have uh for decades been desperate to get a lower yen to get that benefit of their you know, foreign earnings translation and, and um, you know, it's in, in many ways me mechanical, right? In terms of the yeah. benefit for those companies. You know, what I think- Carry the trade thing is, uh, is also a major carry trade. It is also, you know, it, it can, I mean, obviously Japan remains the lowest yielding currency in the world, major right. currency in the world. And so, you know, continues to be a source of carry trade. But I think what we're seeing here is we're just basically seeing the fundamental divergence. Like, you did have the central bank come in and whack it, right? And yeah, the intervention and, last uh, fall. The intervention right last fall, which you can see there. You know, yeah. note we're about to go through that intervention that we saw last fall. It, it, it combined with a moment where it looked like the US was slowing down and there was going to be, you know, a slowing of the tightening pace. And so you kind of got a self reinforcing, you know, intervention in the fundamentals dynamic in the US side that continued through past the SVB situation. But, you know, now that that basically has cleared, what do you see with the yen? Will you basically see a circumstance where we're going back to where we were, you know, for much of 2022, which is like Japan is weak. It doesn't need tightening. Maybe it needs a little bit more tightening, a little bit more tighter policy, but it doesn't need radically tighter policy. And the U.S. needs, you know, is growing very strongly and needs tighter monetary policy and higher yields. And so you put that together. You know, this is one of those challenging trades that's a one-way trade until it isn't. Um, yeah. In the in the process, having traded through a few yen interventions, uh, MOF interventions, we're pretty yeah. early in that process. That's the thing I would highlight, which is they just they just they have a pattern. I, I've I've seen this. You know, it even and it doesn't matter that we have a new BOJ chairman. The BOJ is by and large not the one that's making the decisions. In in Japan, yeah. there it's a little weird. It's the MO, the Ministry of Finance that makes the decisions, right. and they have a very uh, clear pattern that they do. They first say 
that they're keeping an eye on the currency. Then they do price checks. Yeah, check then they, rates. Yeah. They, they check rates yeah. and they do that for a little bit. And then what they do is they they stealthily intervene and then they moderately intervene and then they kick, you know, kick the hell out yeah. of it. Right. That's their their process. And I just saw a note actually a couple uh, like a day ago that they were uh, monitoring closely. So I think we're still pretty okay. early in this process. OK. All right. And uh, you think the Fed's going to go ahead and hike? Uh, is that what the 10 year is saying? That That's uh, what, what the 10 year is saying. Yeah. And the, the thing that's really important is it's not just that they're going to go hike, but that there's more pricing that can come into the market. Right. Because only like two thirds of a hike or three quarters of a hike of one hike is priced in. And, you know, like, what do you have to do? Chairman Powell get, goes to Congress and says, I'm hiking twice. They put it in the dots. They say they're hiking twice. Like, what do they have to do to prove to you that they're going to hike twice? I mean, they're going to hike uh, twice. How about, and then how about get going, it. A, going a half <laughs> uh, in between meetings? Well, I... <laughs> like the old days. Yeah, I was going to say, the, yeah, you know, without being, we have a woke, days. we have a woke <laughs> fed. We have a woke <laughs> fed. Bob, why, why don't they just come in? Uh, you know, I mean, the market's saying they're behind the curve. Real estate prices, uh, uh, the recovery in real estate. Uh, you know, we had a little come off of uh, on claims. Uh, what do you think? Uh, when do you think claims are going to start showing job loss? Do you well, think we're getting all, I, closer? I love the idea of a grizzled trader. Uh, you know, uh, running the Fed. You know, that's that's what it should be. <laughs> yeah. I, well, they, you know, there were a lot of guys in Chicago uh, in the S&P pit that would be better Fed chairman. So, uh, uh, at, you know, uh, that would, you know, um, that's happened before at the Fed. They used to keep us off balance. I know, I know. And now, you know, what what you look at, and 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 I guess you know this goes back to to the more fundamentals question, which is when do we start to get a meaningful deterioration in the labor market? And you know you've got like weakness in the labor market isn't isn't just some exogenous thing that just kind of happens, right? Right. It happens. Weakness in the labor market happens in response to other activities, and so in particular happens in response to a meaningful decline in earnings. And I'm not talking like a couple percent or something like that. I'm talking like 15, 20% and you start to get meaningful job layoffs. It starts, you know, it comes when you start to get growth transitioning, not from 2% to 1%, like a lot of bickering. Like, are we like possibly in maybe a tiny recession? Like who cares? Like, you know, labor markets are tight. People are keeping their workforce. That's pretty obvious. Like yeah, they don't growth. want to go through the process they just went through right, after right. the pandemic. Right, right. Hiring and then hiring. I mean, yeah. you know, what a what a pain, right? And so, you know, the the we've got to see growth at like negative two uh, in order to start to get, we, you know, meaningful weakening of the labor market. And on top of it, in order to really start to free up slack in the in the economy, like to get a 100, 100 basis point up move in the unemployment rate, you know, you're talking about having to have like negative 2 million jobs or something, you know, you've got to have like you know, 2 million yeah. jobs off trend, right? So you've got to have like, uh, you know, negative job prints, you know, month after month after month, you know, and right now we're adding 300,000 jobs a year, a month, you know, it's like, we're just so far away from that point. You know, early in uh, the hiking campaign, um, it seemed like uh, Paul was focused on the wealth effect, and it and seemed he's like sure giving he that up, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, because the market has, uh, you know, been in his face for over a year. Um, you know, there were a lot of people thinking what we, because the economy is so financialized, what we needed a break in the market uh, to slow things down, and uh, here we are. Um, you know, just another stone throw from new highs in the S and P's. Uh, the June, what a June! What the market what a had. June. I know what a June. So the bears got harpooned in June. So uh, what do you think is going to happen in July? Just more of the same. There's well, June. I think you know. I mean, June was a particularly special uh, month. Let's say in terms of yeah. how much you know, because I think part of it was a broad based recognition that we are in this uh couple steps behind the curve dynamic right like a lot of the you know the bond market started to move a bit 
and particularly in the short end, started to move in May, but it was really June where you got stocks rallying, even though bonds were selling off a little bit in yeah. price. And so, um, you know, we're not going to see uh, the magnitude of the extension of, of uh, the rally that we've, the, the pace of rally that we saw here. This has been quite, quite a, a, a month along that dimension. Um, but yeah. the idea that we could continue to see sort of this moderate grind of, you know, stocks outperforming bonds, you yeah, know, that could definitely be the case, you know, for a few months until we start to see the Fed get a little more aggressive. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Copper mm. looks like it has COVID. <laughs> Technically. <laughs> So I don't know. Maybe it we're going to put in. Like it COVID. I love it. Yeah, yeah it, the test, the chart test says it came back positive. Um, this is an important market for global growth, isn't it? For sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, part of what we're seeing there is the global goods market is pretty soft. Like you know, anywhere you look, look at Korean exports or Chinese exports or or what's going on with production in, in continental Europe or, you know, e even U.S. manufacturing is soft, you know, like goods. Basically, what we had is we had a huge surge of goods in, you know, during COVID. And then basically it's been flat for the last two years, goods demand in the U.S. And, and China and others aren't picking up the slack. And so the idea that you have uh, soft prices in things that give you a good read on goods demand makes makes sense to me um okay. i think the issue is that like you know good goods isn't aren't the problem right like the problem is that if you run a restaurant in peoria you can't find anybody to work for you and you have to wait raise people's wages 10 percent a year like that's the problem like it's not we got plenty of goods all the goods you want uh it's it's the problem is the labor market at least, you know, in the U.S., but also in Europe, in the U.K., in Australia, is too tight. It's just all there is to it. So, uh, you know, they say the most rate-sensitive group um, is is tech, right? And it's really been, uh, has it bothered you that it's been about eight stocks uh, that are responsible <laughs> for, you know, the old nifty 50, only here I'll use a um ncaa term uh, elite eight yeah, it's been the elite eight i like that i like that yes term uh, you can use it, it. Uh, <laughs> i've got a million of them so uh does that bother you that it's that concentrated and shouldn't high, higher rates maybe get people to start rotating even if the market's good okay so here i'll be a bull the market's good uh when you be rotate uh the market might start to rotate out of tech and start buying things like cat and deer and um, yeah yeah you know, well, the, I mean, the old I, economy stocks i think you have i mean you have seen uh, a little bit of rotation uh a little there's bit of deer. rotation what's that there's deer Came yeah, a little like yeah. you know, you've gotten a few signs, a few inklings of rotation. Is kind of what I'd say. Not, not today, but um, yeah. but you know, on a couple of days through through June, you saw you know smaller small caps. Oh yeah, caps. The Russell. Uh, yep, non tech start to you know basically everything other than tech uh, start to do you know outperform what you're seeing in Nasdaq, and I think that kind of I think there's two points to that that, that are interesting. One. I think what it highlights is the 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 the, mo the extension of the breath in this in this um, in this period is yeah. a little you know is to some extent indicative of of the more macro force of the few steps behind the curve Fed than it is like some AI boom like yeah in May there's some AI like yeah. garbage that some you know anyway I, I I I'm not an AI expert but like you know. It seemed implausible what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> and now well, we're starting I, I, to, to see yeah. it broaden out, which I think is reflective of that macro environment. And I think it's probably, you know, when we look at what hedge funds are, how they're positioned, it's interesting that they are they're still to their to their detriment staying away from the tech, uh US mega cap tech stocks and really continuing to look for value in, you know, in smaller companies. Well well, maybe they should buy the uh, regionals. Uh, <laughs> do you think it's a, do you think it's over 
the crisis that we had, that it was just a, you know, three day thing uh, patched up and we can just move on from that? Or has it just been, you know, maybe it reemerges again because, you know, this still isn't that bullish yet. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and the big guys too. XL, look at Goldman. Uh, Goldman's been, uh, you know, hasn't really performed during this blow off either. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, the, the, if you look at the hard data, you see that bank funding conditions are improving. Oh, um, wasn't it a surprise? They all passed the stress test. They all passed the stress test. Oh, yeah, well, what, the, what, what a all shock. All the big banks are going to pass the stress test no matter Well, what. they were, of course. Um, but, but the, the, you know, the banks, the, the areas of banks, like the regionals and the super regionals that were of some concern, you know, you look at their data on a, on a, on a week to week basis, and it looks like it's improving. Funding conditions are improving. And if you go back to that KRE chart, you know, like what we're, what's going on in terms of the pricing is people are pricing in, uh, you know, the price today is the same as it was when there was a real risk of a self-reinforcing bank run across the banking system. And right. that is not going to happen. And the Fed has made clear that that's not going to happen. And so, you know, those, those stocks still look like they have decent value. They're not going to be as, uh, you know, they're not going to be incredible uh, in terms of their earning potential. But, you know, you see, they're certainly not, shouldn't be con priced consistent with the fact that, you know, reasonable risk of a bank run because it's not happening. Okay, um, so it, it, we don't have to worry about that anymore. There's no. Don't have to worry problem. about that. You guys. How, how other about solvency about. issues? How about solvency issues with things like pension funds that own that paper that got the banks in trouble, and municipalities and. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that you know, you're very different in the OA crisis. The main problem was that you had you know, banks that were 30 times levered holding credit risky securities that were marked to market and destroyed their capital base, right? The okay. people, you know, the, the entities that hold the majority of credit risk today are first the banks that have a lot less leverage, right? They're under 10 to one leverage instead of 30 to one leverage. Okay. And then also a lot of it's in the hands, a lot of that credit and extent, credit extension is in the hands of unlevered places like pension funds. Like, a pension fund's never going to matter. <laughs> to any in any time frame we care about, a pension fund's not going to matter. They're not going to, you know, if they lose a little bit too much money, you know, they lose money on stocks. They've lost forty percent on stocks, no problem. You know, they can easily lose meaningful amounts of money on bonds or credit instruments, and that's fine. No big deal. Okay. All right, Bob. You know, it's always great to be able to to talk to you. I I just have one tip uh, for you. Uh, before we leave and yeah that's, uh yeah here's the chart build a silo in your backyard and ah. fill it up with wheat <laughs> <laughs> fill it up to the top to the rim but with wheat and beans with wheat and beans i got it yeah. well you know the, yeah it's the real way an to answer this, go ahead the real way to do that is to buy farmland yeah. in uh countries with depressed currencies you know interesting yeah. Right. Yeah. If farmland, it's our, it, global yeah. farmland doesn't trade uh, priced in dollars, even though the asset itself is priced in dollars. So See, something to you, think about. Australian right. farmland. I, Today's the day. OK. You know, I mean, I throw up something that I didn't think you'd be familiar with. And you give me uh, and then you've thought about this. I've, th I've thought about it. I've, I've uh, you know, you, you don't realize it, Dale, but I, I'm a botanist by uh, by oh, academic okay. training. So, yeah, uh, specializing in uh, in uh, in irrigated growth, uh, irrigated okay. uh, crop environments. So uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every once in a while pops up. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, you know, I, there's no profession I admire more than what farmers they have a tougher job than traders because if they they work so hard and they bring in a good crop everyone has a good crop and they don't get good prices that's right unless that's they're right. Ahead. and then when there's a short crop prices are good but they don't have as much have to sell. Crop. i yeah. know and the thing that's that's always i actually i do a radio spot with uh with uh with a farm uh radio channel that uh, on a on a regular basis and it is incredible how sophisticated those folks are when it comes to financial markets and thinking about prices and trends and it's it, you know they're they're not only are they like you know 
growing growing uh, wheat, but they're also you know masters in in markets, um, which is always pretty incredible. All right, look at this. Um, Bob has an ETF, right? That's right. That's right. The right. HFND Tell ETF. Us about it. Uh, it is a, uh, what we've done is, uh, my co-founder Bruce and I have 50 years of experience in the hedge fund business. We build a technology that replicates the gross of fees returns, the, the returns before fees are taken out of the hedge fund industry. And, uh, and we use that to build an ETF, the HFNV ETF, uh, which is available on most of the, uh, discount platforms that are out there. So, uh, so check it out. See if it's the right uh, if it's right for you. You can find more information at unlimitedfunds.com. There's that good looking guy right there on the website. All right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, really, uh, I really appreciate your giving nature to come and share your views with our community, Bob. And uh, you're a trading warrior brother of mine, and I'm rooting for you to have a great summer season of forecasting and uh, reaping from the market. To use another. <laughs> anytime anytime dale you want to talk uh you want to talk agriculture uh you know farm prices or uh or other markets i'm i'm up for it i, I love yeah, coming yeah, on yeah. here Let's i say. know i know i know i could bring up anything bob uh <laughs> you know you're one of a handful of guys i i could just talk about everything you make it easy for me um have a great holiday bob and uh let's get back together um, I'll hit you up on Twitter and we'll set up another date. Perfect. All right. Great to see you, Dale. Really All right, appreciate Bob it. El Bob Elliott, everybody. Check out his ETF. Uh, that's a wrap for us. Uh, everyone have a great weekend. Uh, recharge your battery. I believe we're going to be here Monday. Uh, if anyone's here, uh, Steve, I'll probably see you Monday. And you can join the team in 15 minutes on the morning edge. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.